Hello everyone and welcome to Learning with Lee, where we discuss nature and wildlife on Kiowa Island. I'm your host, Lee Bundrick, Land Preservation Coordinator for the Kiowa Conservancy. Today we're going to have a discussion about Kiowa Island's bobcats with Jim Jordan, wildlife biologist for the town of Kiowa Island. Hi Jim, glad to have you with us today. Thanks Lee, glad to be here. So Jim, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm Jim Jordan, the town's wildlife biologist. Um, I've been here for almost 20 years. Um, done a lot of research over those years on a number of native species here, including bobcats. So what role do bobcats play in Kiowa Island's barrier island ecosystem? So bobcats are you know, one of the top predators out here on Kiowa. Um, and since they sit at the top of the food chain, they have a pretty big impact on you know, all the other native animals that are you know, further down the food chain. And so bobcats you know, exert that influence mainly by you know, feeding on prey species and influencing their populations. Um, one great example is with our deer population out here. So bobcats eat deer fawns every spring and summer. Um, and by doing that, they basically, at least historically, have helped to regulate Kiowa's deer population. Um, so you mentioned deer as a food source for the bobcats in Kiowa Island. What are some of their other main food sources? So we've been doing research on bobcats here at Kiowa for more, more than 20 years. And a lot of that research is focused on their food habits. So what are these bobcats eating? And what we found is that for the most part throughout the year, the majority of their diet are rodents. And that is everything from rats and mice to squirrels. Um, so throughout the year, most of what they're eating is rodents, but then they, they key in on, on other species depending on the time of year. So deer, fawns in particular, um, they'll kind of shift a little bit to those in the spring and summer when they're available. And then we've also noticed that they tend to eat a lot more birds um, in the winter months. But the use of rodents um, stays pretty consistent throughout the year. How abundant are bobcats on the island and how have their populations changed over the years? So Kiwa historically has had a, a very healthy, stable bobcat population. Um, when we first began doing research with bobcats out here in the late 90s. We estimated that we had 30 to 35 bobcats on the island. And that population has pretty much remained the same until the last couple of years. So beginning in 2017, we started to see to notice some issues in the bobcat population. Um, we seem to be seeing fewer, fewer bobcats. We're having a harder time catching bobcats for our research projects. And then in the last two years, we've really noticed, you know, an increase in, in the mortality rate, you know, within our bobcats. And that, you know, apparent decline in population um, has been confirmed here in the last two years. And currently we think, you know, based on mortality rates from our collared cats, um, home range size and a number of other things that we probably have 10 or fewer bobcats remaining on Kiowa right now. So what are the, some of the activities that are contributing to their declines in populations? So much of our research over the last 10 years is, is really tried to focus on how bobcats are, you know, adjusting to increased development and potentially loss of habitat on the island. And we've noticed that there is certainly, you know, that is a contributing factor. Um, every time you lose a little bit of habitat, you know, a bobcat's got to roam a little further or look a little harder to find food. Um, so that's certainly playing at least a minor role in their decline, though we don't think it's, it's very substantial. Um, what, what is clear, you know, to be the, the biggest impact right now is the use of second generation anticoagulants. Um, these are rodenticides that are, you know, put out to control rodent populations. You know, we've noticed some direct mortality here in the last year, and we think that's, that's basically the, the primary reason why our bobcat numbers are declining here in the last three years. So what are second generation anticoagulants and what are they specifically used for? So second generation anticoagulant rodenticides. Um, they are basically used to control rodent populations. They were developed 20 or 30 years ago as rodent populations across the world became more resistant to some of the original anticoagulants, which would have been the first generation ones. Um, so these second generation rodenticides are much more toxic than 
than the first generation ones. Um, so whereas the first generation ones were what were called multiple dose anticoagulants, these are single dose. So that means that their toxicity is substantially higher such that if a rat or mouse eats, you know, one bite of this product, they will die, um, but it will still take, you know, three to seven days for them to die, um, but it is lethal in, in one feeding. So second generation anticoagulants, the way in which they, they kill a, a rat or a mouse, um, you know, as the name would imply, they are an anticoagulant. So effectively, what it does is it, it, it basically eliminates the ability for a rat or mouse to clot their own blood. So because they, their blood can't clot effectively, they, they bleed to death internally, um, but it's not a quick process. It can take you know, three to seven days for that to happen. And so during that you know, time period when they're, they're not feeling well, you know, they're out in the environment moving around, still in their easy prey for you know, things like bobcats and hawks and owls and that sort of thing. Uh, so how do second generation anticoagulants actually impact bobcats? So bobcats pick up these second generation anticoagulants by feeding on sick, dying, or dead rodents that have, that have also fed on this. So effectively the rat or mouse goes into a bait box, it eats the second generation anticoagulant poison, comes out, and then is you know, roaming around in the landscape, pretty easy for a bobcat to catch. And so they, they eat the rat or mouse and then they pick up a little bit of this toxin. So because this toxin can stay in their body for up to a year, maybe longer, um, you know, if they pick up a little bit every day, over time it's gonna get to the point where you know, basically it's, it's gonna ultimately kill that bobcat if it accumulates to a high enough level. And that's what we're seeing with, with our bobcats out here. Um, and so that's a process known as secondary poisoning. So bobcats are not, you know, directly consuming the poison, but they are eating the rat or mouse that has that poison in their, in their system. So how do we know that the bobcats on the island are being affected by these SGAs? So the only way we know about the impact of SGAs here on Kiowa is through our bobcat GPS work. Now, without that work, we wouldn't know that these bobcats were dying. Um, so when we put a collar, you know, on one of our bobcats, that, that collar has a mortality sensor in it. And so effectively, when that collar is stationary for, for four hours or more, we will get a text message or an email um, through, through the online system that tells us that, that that animal is likely dead. And so because we get a notification so quickly, we can get to that animal very quickly. Um, and again, you know, when we find these animals, they're not typically laying, laying in the open. So without, without having a GPS collar and a location of that animal, you know, we would have never known that these mortality events occurred. Um, and then the other key is, you know, when a bobcat dies and you want to figure out what was responsible, you need to get to that bobcat within a day or two um, because you want it to be, you know, you want to be able to get to gather the best data from that bobcat. So you've got to pick it up very quickly. And without having a GPS collar, there'd be no way to do that. Uh, as we know, only a handful of bobcats are equipped with the collars on Kiowa to study their movements. How do the deaths in the past few years look proportional to, to their actual numbers? Okay, so, so as I mentioned, we've been putting GPS collars on bobcats for, for many years. The project started back in, in 2007. Um, and so each year we, you know, trap a certain number of bobcats. It's, it's varied from, from four to eight over the years. And effectively, you know, that is a random subset of the population. So what is, what is taking place to those GPS collared animals is most likely taking place to the rest of the population. So if you look at mortality rates from our collared cats over the last two years, um, in 2019, we had six bobcats with collars. Four of those died. Um, in 2020, we collared four bobcats, and two of those have died already. So eff effectively, you can take the mortality rate that we've seen on our subset of collared animals and apply that to the entire population. So if you do that over the last two years, we had a 66% mortality rate in 2019, and we're at 50% 
so far in 2020 and we're barely halfway through the year. Um, so when you look at a mortality rate that high um, and do the math, it's clear you know, that our numbers have declined drastically here in the last two or three years. You know, and that's, that's one of the evidence, you know, one of the pieces of data that, that we've used to basically estimate our current population at 10 or fewer bobcats. So with these numbers, uh, it sounds like there's a great risk to their population. Is there a risk of them actually becoming extirpated from Kiowa? So yes, there, there is a real risk that bobcats could be eliminated from Kiowa here in the near future. Um, and the mechanism that, that would probably make that happen um, is something called a genetic bottleneck. Um, and so what we know from genetic research um, over the last 10 years is that the genetics of our bobcat population are, are, are you know, it's a, it's a fairly isolated population. So we do not have a whole, a lot of genetic transfer between mainland bobcats and Kiowa Island bobcats. So what can happen when you have a low number of animals that are somewhat isolated is that basically you lose, that population loses genetic diversity. And so the animals become more and more interrelated and then their survivability goes down substantially. So effectively, you know, that's the mechanism that typically causes an isolated population of wildlife to go, you know, to become extinct or be extirpated from an area. Um, is through a loss of genetics. Uh, so with this genetic issue and some other issues on the island, it looks like there needs to be actions taken to prevent uh, further decline due to SGA regenicides in order to protect the bobcat population from further decline. Uh, what are some of the steps taken within the community now in regards to SGA regenicides? So when we first became, became aware of the, the second generation anticoagulant issue last fall when we had the first, first bobcat die from this. Um, we immediately pushed that information out to residents and pest control companies, you know, basically seeking voluntary compliance to stop the use of SGAs in Kiowa. Um, and we made pretty good headway, we thought, last fall um, and hoped that we'd gotten a little bit of a handle on the issue. But then obviously this year with, with having two additional Bobcat mortalities directly from SGAs, um, you know, including the tragic case of, of the female that died, you know, during labor, um, giving birth to four kittens, um, you know, really, I, I guess, kind of told us that, that we needed to do more. Um, and so back in April, town council was prepared to pass an ordinance to ban the use of SGAs on Kiowa, um, but we were informed, actually, the day before that was going to go to council. Um, by the State Department of Pesticide Regulation that legally we could not pass an ordinance like that. And that is because regulation of, of pesticides in the state of South Carolina is solely the responsibility um, of the state through the Department of Pesticide Regulation. So once we learned that, um, we, we basically developed a, you know, a, an improved public education plan um, you know, and again, targeted the same, the same stakeholder group. So pest control companies, businesses, regimes, property owners. Um, and then we added what, what we're calling our Bobcat Guardian Program. And so that basically allows all these individuals and groups of people to make a public pledge not to use SGAs on Kiowa. And if they do so, then, you know, they are certified as a Bobcat Guardian and they're listed on the town's website. And so we're hopeful that this, you know, improved education program for voluntary compliance will help. Um, but we also realize that the situation is, is quite dire and that, you know, we do run the real risk of losing bobcats, which are such a vital part to the Kiowa ecosystem. Um, and so we've also drafted a letter, the town sent a letter um, a week and a half ago to the Clemson Department of Pesticide Regulation and we asked them to issue a one-year ban within the municipal boundaries of the town of Kiowa on the use of SGAs. And we're still waiting to hear their decision on that. Um, don't, don't know how they're gonna rule, but it is, it is fairly unprecedented for a municipality to request this. Um, but I think the uniqueness 
and the seriousness of our issue, um, you know, makes this request, you know, very justified. So, you know, we are hopeful that that one year ban will, will go into place. And if it does, obviously that, that will buy us some time, protect our Bobcats while we can get, continue to push forward these voluntary programs and better educate, you know, all the stakeholder groups out here on the island. Um, so, from with your interaction with pesticide control companies, uh, how, how aware are they of this issue and how it affects predatory species? So, the town has reached out directly to, to all pest control companies that have a business license on the island. And so, we've sent them a targeted email. Um, we also invited all of those pest control companies um, to participate in a Zoom meeting with town staff, um, which we held last week. And we were able to get eight out of the approximately 35 pest control companies on the island to participate. Um, so while we don't know that we've reached all of them, um, they've certainly all received emails, so they should be aware of it. Um, we've also obviously engaged with the Department of Pesticide Regulation. Um, they are aware of the issue and they have pushed it down to the pest control companies as well. Um, and also the state Pest Control Association, which is basically a, a trade group of, of pest, pest control companies here in the state. And so we have had conversations with them as well. So, you know, they are aware of the issue. So are there other locations where this similar phenomenon is occurring with SGAs? So there is a considerable amount of research out there on SGAs and the secondary effects on wildlife. It's been looked at you know, across the world, it's been looked at by our own EPA here. Um, back in 04, when they were, you know, considering basically putting additional restrictions on the use of SGAs um, within the United States. Um, so a lot of data out there, but some of, some of the best data, you know, directly correlated with what we're seeing comes from California. So California for, you know, more than a decade has been collecting a substantial amount of data on SGAs and other rodenticides and their wildlife populations. And so a lot of their research out there focuses on mountain lions, bobcats, and coyotes. And so they've seen very, very high levels of SGAs um, in all three of the, those species. Um, but I've recently spoken with some colleagues out in California um, to tell them about our issue here and there are some, some striking differences in what they are seeing and what we are seeing. And, and it really shows you the seriousness of our problem. And so out in California, while most bobcats have been exposed to SGAs, it is incredibly rare for them to die directly from that. So what they are seeing out there is that basically bobcats that pick up and accumulate SGAs you know, their immune system weakens or they have, you know, so, some other issues that basically make them more vulnerable to other causes of death. So in a lot of cases out there, you know, these bobcats have ultimately died from mange or something similar, um, as opposed to dying directly from these products, basically bleeding to death. Um, and so we've seen three cases here, the three cases that, you know, that we've we've had here at Kiowa have all been, you know, acute or direct mortality from SGAs, which California hasn't seen. In fact, you know, they went back through all their records, you know, when I engaged them last week, and they could only find one that potentially um, could have been a directly caused death from these products. So what's going on at Kiowa right now really doesn't seem to have, you know, doesn't have a precedence anywhere else. Uh, so it sounds like we have a pretty dire issue in Kiowa with the bobcats in SGAs and how it's contributing to their decline in populations. Uh, and one question I do have um, is what can residents on Kiowa Island do to ensure they're doing their part in protecting the lives of the bobcats on the island? So we've talked about the seriousness of the issue with SGAs here at Kiowa. Um, and so the question of what, you know, what can a homeowner do to help out? You know, and, it, and it's pretty simple, you know, stop, stop using SGAs on your property. And if you're using a pest control company, 
inform them in writing that you do not want them to ever use an STA on your property. And that's basically the concept behind the Bobcat Guardian program. Um, but I would take that, take that even a step further. Um, and I would tell, you know, encourage folks to tell their pest control company to follow an integrated pest management strategy. And effectively what that is, and it, it's, an, it's an industry standard, if you will, for pest control companies. And so it, it's, it's fairly simple. So the first step is to figure out if you have a rodent problem. And so that requires a thorough survey of the property um, to look for potential issues that could be contributing to a rodent problem if it, if it exists, and then trying to you know, directly um, eliminate that issue. Um, so, so it's also important to remember that you know, seeing a rat or mouse in your yard or on your deck is not a rodent problem. A rodent problem is when rodents are entering your home and causing some damage to your property, um, your structure in some manner. So when that is taking place, that, that is when you need to take action. Um, and pesticides are not the first step in that process. So if you have rodents entering your home, um, you want your pest control company to basically seal off those, those places where they're getting into the structure. Um, you want them to utilize physical traps inside the house to remove the offending animals. Um, and then assuming that the home has been sealed up adequately, you no longer have a rodent problem. Um, now in the rare cases where problems cannot be dealt with in that manner, the use of pesticides you know, is basically the, the final step in the integrated pest management strategy. Um, so if, if it ever gets to that point, you know, there are pesticides, rodenticides out there that are much, much safer for our bobcats. And those would be products that contain the active ingredients colocalciferol or bromethylene. So switching to a product or using a product with one of those two chemicals um, will substantially reduce impacts to our bobcats. Well, Jim, thanks for joining us today to talk about bobcats and how we might be able to reduce impacts to them on Key Island. You're welcome, Lee. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us today as we talked about Q Island's Bobcats. Uh, tune again next time for another episode of Learning with Lee.